Okay, in class we talked about uh, how the brain develops early on. Now we're going to move on to talk about how the brain adapts after injury and also how it changes as a result of extensive practice in adulthood. You can see here three panels. The first one shows you uh, a healthy cell body with two healthy axons making synapses on the dendrites extending from that cell body. And here you can see that an axon has been injured. One of the presynaptic neurons has been injured and dies off, degenerates, and that leaves vacant synapses on this postsynaptic cell. But that situation tends not to stay that way very long. Uh, instead, the postsynaptic cell releases chemicals, mainly neurotrophins, that encourage the growth of collateral sprouts from nearby healthy axons. As we'll see, this is an important mechanism by which the brain reorganizes itself. The nervous system in general reorganizes itself after injury. So collateral sprouts. These are new branches formed by other non-damaged axons that attach to vacant receptors, that attach to receptor sites that have been left vacant as a result of the death of some presynaptic neuron or neurons. These postsynaptic selves have lost their source of innervation, the input that they were getting, and they release neurotrophins that induce axons to form collateral sprouts. Again, neurotrophins are a class of proteins that encourage the growth and maintenance of neurons and their projections like axons and dendrites. Over several months after the injury, the sprouts fill in most of the vacated synapses. But importantly, these uh, new connections, these new synapses, they can, can be useful, worthless, and in some cases they can even be harmful. The structure of the brain exists as a result of kind of a carefully choreographed dance that's occurred over the course of your entire development, including very early fetal and early postnatal development. And the conditions under which the neurons navigated to the correct locations, under which the axons found their way to the correct locations, those conditions don't necessarily exist in the adult brain. And so sometimes these new synapses aren't useful. In fact, they can often uh, create problems, as we'll see. This is one dramatic example of how the adult brain can reorganize itself after an injury. This work was originally conducted by a guy named Mike Mersnick at UC San Francisco, mostly in the 1980s and 90s. Before this time, it was widely held that the adult brain was more or less static and couldn't undergo dramatic reorganization. This research started to change that view. So in this study, uh, Mike Mersnick and his colleagues mapped out the hand area in macaque monkeys. So this would be the area of the left hemisphere that gets input from the right hand of this monkey. If you zoom in, you can see that there are individual areas of somatosensory cortex here that represent each of the digits, they get input, touch input, from each of these digits, and also from the adjacent palm areas right here. So not only is there an area of the brain devoted to touch of the hand, but there are individual areas within there, sub-areas, that represent each of the digits. Now, the figure shows the borders between these areas as being crisp, but that's not really the case. The borders between these areas are a bit fuzzy. So then what happens after you remove a digit, let's say the middle finger here? Again, before this, most neuroscientists would have assumed that the part of cortex that represents that digit would just go quiet. It would lost its input, and so the neurons there would become silent. They would stop firing because they weren't getting any input. Mersnick and his colleagues found otherwise. They went back in and evaluated the mapping in this part of the brain several months after the digit had been amputated. And you can see right here is the part of cortex that used to represent that third digit, the middle finger. And it's not quiet. Rather, it's come to represent the adjacent two digits, the fourth and the second, and part of the adjacent palm area. And this is really a remarkable reorganization of the cortex for an adult animal. So what's going on here? How does the brain reorganize itself after this kind of damage? There are a couple of mechanisms that go into this. 
For example, there's something called denervation supersensitivity. If a postsynaptic cell loses its input, one of its responses is to uh, increase the sensitivity to the neurotransmitter that it normally receives after the destruction of that incoming axon. So in other words, the postsynaptic cell will sort of turn up the gain, turn up the volume on the input that it is getting, such that it becomes super sensitive to what little input might be left. What this also means is that as new collateral sprouts grow in and take up those vacant postsynaptic cells receptor sites, the postsynaptic cell will be super sensitive to that input. Another mechanism is disuse supersensitivity. So in this case, the postsynaptic cell may not have lost its input altogether by the destruction of that incoming axon, but rather the inactivity of that axon. So the axon, the presynaptic cell's axon, is having many, many fewer action potentials. And so the net result is more or less the same. The postsynaptic cell tries to balance out the amount of activity that it has. It's lost a lot of its input. It's feeling lonely, you might say. And so it sort of turns up the volume on the inputs that it's getting. Both of these mechanisms allow parts of the brain and specific neurons within the brain to become more sensitive to their input and trying to compensate for the loss of input. Again, this can help balance out the, the pattern of activity across the brain, but it can also cause problems. You don't necessarily want those new inputs to create a, a larger response in the postsynaptic cell. This supersensitivity can be produced both by an increase in the number of receptors on the postsynaptic cell and also in the effectiveness of those receptors. For example, for a metabotropic synapse, those metabolic changes that occur in the postsynaptic cell could become exaggerated. For example, the second messenger systems could increase their responsiveness to the, the neurotransmitter. And that brings us to phantom limb syndrome, which you may have heard of. This is a continued sensation from an amputated body part. And it doesn't have to be a limb. It can be uh, an individual finger. In women who've had a mastectomy, they sometimes experience phantom breast syndrome. And it's thought to reflect largely denervation supersensitivity. So parts of the brain and spinal cord that were receiving input from the missing body part are no longer getting that input. And so they sort of turn up the volume on the inputs that they're getting. Subsequently, the cortex can reorganize itself after the amputation of the body part and become responsive to other parts of the body. Let me show you how this might happen. Some phantom limb patients report that touch to parts of the body other than the missing limb induce sensations of touch in the missing limb. So for example, one individual lost most of his left arm, and his neurologists found that when they touched certain parts of his face or his shoulder, the patient felt touch in his hand. So these numbers here represent digits. The first digit is the thumb, forefinger, and so on. So touching different parts of the face induces the patient to feel touch on the face, but they also simultaneously feel touch on the missing limb. Likewise with the shoulder. Touch to different parts of the shoulder produces a sensation of touch on the shoulder, but also in the missing hand. Why might this be? Well, let's look at the somatotopic map in somatosensory cortex. You can see that each part of the body is represented in different parts of cortex. Now let's take a look at the hand area. This part of cortex has now lost its input. Where is it most likely to get new input? Well, remember that the borders between these areas are somewhat fuzzy, and so these neurons already have some input from adjacent areas of cortex, which are likely to be the face and the shoulder. But as these uh, postsynaptic cells in this part of cortex and also in other parts of the spinal cord, as they lose their input, they may induce the growth of collateral sprouts into the receptor sites occupied by degenerated axons. Where are those collateral sprouts likely to come from? They're most likely to come from healthy inputs in nearby areas, which would include the upper arm and the face. 
So the original axons that brought input from the missing limb degenerate and leave vacant synapses onto which other axons sprout, axons from healthy neurons that represent parts of the body that are still there. Here's that figure again. So you could imagine that this postsynaptic cell here is in the spinal cord or maybe in the cortex getting input from a certain part of the body. As some of that input degenerates, collateral sprouts grow in. These collateral sprouts may be from a different part of the body. Importantly, sometimes the phantom limb sensation doesn't just involve a sense of touch, but rather intense pain. Some patients report that the missing limb actually still hurts them, and this can become debilitating. It was once thought that the phantom limb pain came from damage to the nerves as the limb was amputated. And so sometimes the patient would undergo a second surgery to amputate a little bit more of the limb and try and do a better job at cutting the nerve. This rarely worked because the problem wasn't the limb itself, it wasn't the peripheral nerve. Rather, it was changes in the organization of the brain itself. For example, you could imagine that this postsynaptic cell was getting input from pain receptors from a missing hand, let's say. If axons grow in from, let's say, the face or a different part of the body, then this postsynaptic neuron is now getting what it thinks are pain signals from input that has nothing to do with pain. So the patient nonetheless experiences pain even though there's not really any physical tissue damage happening. Extensive practice of skills can also change the brain in a way that improves the skill. So now we're moving away from discussing the brain's changes to damage to talking about the brain's changes to behavior and actions and training, learning. For example, MRI studies, this would be structural MRI, not functional MRI studies, found that the temporal lobe of professional musicians in the right hemisphere can be 30% larger than that of non-musicians. This is a part of the brain that's important for processing hearing. Other studies have shown that there's thicker cortex, thicker cortical gray matter, in the part of the brain responsible for hand control and for vision in professional keyboard players. The idea is that the extensive practice of playing the keyboard increases the number of connections and possibly the number of neurons in this part of cortex, allowing finer and more precise control of the hand. And then parts of the visual cortex that might be involved in reading music also become thicker. This is a figure from that study. What's shown in red here aren't areas of increased activity, but rather areas where the cortex is thicker in professional keyboardists than in amateur keyboardists, and thicker in amateur keyboardists than in non-musicians. This part of the brain here includes both primary motor cortex and primary somatic sensory cortex for the hand in both hemispheres. And then down here in the inferior temporal lobe is an area of the brain that's important for object recognition. And this increase in thickness may be a result of the extensive practice in reading music. There are lots of ways the brain can be damaged, including strokes, tumors, infections, exposure to toxic substances, degenerative diseases, closed head injuries, Closed head, in, closed head injuries are the most common uh, cause of closed head injuries are the most common cause of brain damage in young people. Strokes are the most common cause of brain damage in older folks. This is just showing you uh, a couple of examples of brains after certain kinds of damage. This person had a stroke and died shortly thereafter as a result of that stroke. Notice the massive swelling in the right hemisphere and the shearing, the tearing of brain tissue here and here. As we'll see, one of the main problems that occurs after a stroke is the swelling, the edema in the brain. This individual also had a stroke, but they lived for many years after the stroke. Nonetheless, you can see where the stroke was, and you can see the necrotic tissue, the dying tissue. There are holes in the brain, and you can see that the mass of this area of the brain is much smaller, and the ventricle is enlarged here as a result of the loss of neurons. And this individual 
died of a gunshot wound straight through the brain. Survivors of brain damage can show anywhere from subtle behavioral recovery to substantial, almost complete behavioral recovery. There are a lot of factors that influence this, including the age of the patient when they had the brain damage, the extent of the brain damage, and the exact functions that were lost. Many of the mechanisms of recovery after brain damage are similar to those that occur during early brain development. For example, new branching of axons and dendrites can occur. A closed head injury involves brain trauma that occurs when there's a sharp blow to the head that drives brain tissue against the inside wall of the skull. And this is one of the main causes of brain injury in young adults. A stroke, or cerebrovascular accident, CVA for short, is a temporary loss of blood flow to part of the brain, and this is the most common cause of brain damage in the elderly. There are two types of strokes. Ischemic strokes, or ischemia, are the most common kind by far. They result from a blood clot or some other obstruction of an artery that results in a loss of blood and nutrients to the parts of the brain fed by that artery. So the neurons downstream from that clot lose their oxygen and they lose their glucose supply. Hemorrhagic strokes are much less frequent, fortunately. Uh, they result from a ruptured artery. In this case, blood rushes into the interstitial fluid around the neurons, and neurons themselves become flooded with excess calcium, oxygen, and other blood products. Both types of stroke produce edema, or swelling, and excess sodium inside the neurons. This, in turn, triggers the release of glutamate, which, as you know, is the most common excitatory neurotransmitter in the nervous system. This results in an overstimulation of neurons in the damaged part of the brain and leads to sodium and other ions entering the neurons in even higher amounts. And ultimately, this excess of positive ions in the neuron blocks its metabolism in the mitochondria and kills the neuron. Ischemic and hemorrhagic strokes, again, both cause edema, the accumulation of fluid in the brain, resulting in increased pressure on the brain, which in turn can block other arteries and increase the probability of further strokes. Disruption of the sodium-potassium pump in the neurons, again, leads to an accumulation of sodium ions inside the neurons, which hastens their death. Within the central nervous system, the brain and spinal cord, when axons are damaged, they typically don't regenerate. They typically don't grow back, mainly because of the production of scar tissue that physically blocks the regrowth of those axons, uh, but also because the scar tissue tends to release chemicals which inhibit the growth of those axons. While this might seem like a poor design, it's actually somewhat important. We've talked about how the conditions that exist early in development may not exist in the adult brain. And so it's often difficult for neurons to know where to grow back and where to make synapses. So in the central nervous system, axons might only regenerate one or two millimeters in mature mammals. In non-mammalian species, sometimes they can regrow more, as we've seen with the salamander and the newt. As a result of this, paralysis caused by spinal cord damage is generally permanent. In some cases, individuals with spinal cord damage can learn to use the leftover neurons, the ones that have not been damaged, in ways that allow them to regain some extra control over their lower limbs. But usually axons don't regrow through the spinal cord. Again, scar tissue can make a mechanical barrier to inhibit axon growth. And the myelin in the central nervous system releases proteins that actively inhibit the growth of axons. That said, damaged axons do grow back under certain circumstances. If an axon in the peripheral nervous system is crushed, as opposed to cut, it can follow its myelin sheath back to the target and generally grows back toward the periphery at a rate of about one millimeter per day. Cut neurons can also sometimes regrow. Uh, you've heard of people losing a hand or a finger and having it reattached, and they will regain some or most of the control and 
somatosensory input from that part of the body. Generally, the surgeon will reattach the nerve itself, and while the axons may not grow back into the exact myelin sheath that they were connected to before, nonetheless, neurons can sometimes regrow through that cut and continue following the myelin sheath of another axon to the target.